Okay. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, and thanks to everyone for dialing in for the webinar this morning. Um, so this, this just about marks uh, the somewhat depressing one year anniversary of co COVID quarantine for our team. Um, but thankfully we do have a, a CMBS market that's alive and, and kicking. Um, this morning, we'd like to spend some time uh, touching on each core sector um, Freddie, SASB, Conduit, CRE, CLO, to highlight what we're seeing, what's concerning, uh, provide some insight into our analysis and cover any other topic that, that might be of interest. Um, so we'll try to leave some time at the end for Q&A, so please submit any questions you might have and we'll try to address them to the best of our ability. Um, joining me today are three senior members of the New Deal team, uh, Ed Dittmer, Brandon Olson, and Greg Haddad. I believe I'm the only one uh, in an actual DBRS Morningstar office at the moment. I can confirm I'm safely social distancing as one of two people on a 25,000 square foot floor, so uh, I'm safe here. Um, whether that uh, situation changes anytime soon is something I think we'll cover a little bit later. Um, and I apologize if I'm breaking some sort of Zoom commandment by having a window behind me, but uh, I didn't wanna be sitting in one of our dark conference rooms uh, with a laptop uh, piled onto uh, a big stack of papers. So uh, I hope it's uh, not too dark here. Um, so for now, let's uh, kick things off in the SASB market. You know, things are moving at a, at a breakneck pace to start the year again, uh, not quite as strong as last year when uh, 16 deals totaling over $8 billion had come to market in the first eight weeks of the year. Um, but this year's tally of 12 deals and, and more than 5 billion is still really impressive by historic standards. Um, also from last year, that, that big number was, was really massively skewed um, by the $3.4 billion BXLP industrial deal. Um, so again, this year is, is off to, to a, a rollicking start. Um, the attraction of the sector for investors, uh, we think does seem pretty obvious given the performance of, of existing SASBs. You know, while there are a large number of SASB transactions uh, in special servicing right now, you know, they're prominent, predominantly um, secured by hotel and weaker quality mall assets, uh, two property types we're not really seeing any of in, in the new issue market today. Um, and even those transactions um, are largely insulated from all but the most extreme value declines. Um, so, so while there is a high special servicing rate, um, I think it's our view that that's in no, due in no small part to the fact that CMBS 2.0 SASBs often were structured um, with bonds, you know, well below investment grade or even sort of unrated. Um, so not every SASB loan loss will, will mean a loss to rated bonds, and we do feel like nearly all investment grade rated classes are really strongly positioned. Um, so Greg, um, let me turn it over to you. What are we seeing in terms of property type mix and new issue SASBs over the past few months? Sure. I think um, in terms of property types, uh, we're definitely overweight, I would say, uh, office buildings and industrial portfolios uh, in our pipeline. Um, office front, we're seeing, I think, primarily um, Class A assets, either call it urban CBD, um, a ton in Silicon Valley, and uh, life science assets, um, primarily with long-term leases to investment-grade tenants. Um, industrial also has been, I think, fairly prolific. Um, Blackstone continues to really corner the market there through significant acquisitions uh, in 2020 and now into 2021. Um, portfolios on the industrial side, generally uh, high quality assets, functional bulk warehouse, um, clustered in usually strong industrial markets. Uh, I think overall, I think investor demand is really shaping the type of properties that we're seeing currently as these sort of investment grade occupied office assets and industrial portfolios are relatively easy to analyze. And I think understand from a credit standpoint, since they've experienced extremely limited impact from the pandemic in terms of you know, forbearance or tenant issues. Um, I think in the case, um, office workers are probably not at their desk today, uh, especially given you know, us right now as an example, but I think having an investment grade entity on the hook for a long-term lease gives you a substantial level of comfort with regards to the volatility of future cash flows at the assets. Um, and I think, you know, industrial particularly, you know, the warehouse distribution facilities that are located in primarily dense urban info markets have been viewed to be somewhat recession proof um, given their performance both in the last downturn and what we've seen through the, uh, the last year of the pandemic. Uh, as you highlighted, you know, a lot of these office deals with large investment grade tenants, sometimes on long-term leases, you know, what, what type of 
you know, beneficial treatment, um, you know, does somebody get with a long-term versus not a long-term lease? And when we're seeing loans structured with uh, an anticipated repayment date a few years in advance of, of a, of a lease expiration, you know, how are, how are we generally looking at those? Sure. So I think in terms of investment grade tenant with a, as we call it, a long-term credit tenancy lease. So if your lease uh, expires either three years or greater beyond the loan term, uh, the benefit can be pretty substantial. Um, in that case, we would default to a minimum vacancy rate based on the tenant's rating, anywhere from 0% for AAA to uh, 4% for a triple B to be low tenant. Um, we would underwrite uh, no TIs and LCs in that case, as well as straight line the rent steps through the loan term. So the pickup in terms of cash flow and value is actually pretty substantial there. Um, in terms of loan structure, I think quite a few of these transactions um, have an ARD anticipated repayment date structure, which I think not something we saw quite a bit in the last few years, but um, definitely there's been a resurgence in the past few months, which as you said, makes sense. I think given the majority of the single credit, credit tenant nature of the collateral we're seeing with a loan expiry relatively close to the lease maturity date, um, the ARD really, I think, helps to mitigate the binary risk around a single tenant departure. Um, in terms of our approach to that, uh, we can potentially give credit for an ARD structure. Um, however, it is a pretty comprehensive analysis, so it's kind of hard to generally ballpark the credit. It's really a transition-specific analysis decision on our part with a number of, I'd say, interplaying variables. Um, whether or not the tenant is receiving LTCT treatment uh, can be very impactful, as well as the overall leverage, the length of the ARD period, um, the amount of cash we can sweep to hyper amortize the loan after debt service and potentially the presence of subordinate debt, which has to be maintained current during the ARD period and also can split the amort proceeds. Got it. Yeah, it seems like if uh, if you're not gonna be paying down all that much debt, the trade-off um, in, in terms of almost having to look at it as a dark or multi-tenant uh, asset is, is not worth it. Um, you had also mentioned, you know, industrial uh, as well. That's clearly on everyone's wish list on, on both the data and equity sides. Are there any potential issues in that sector um, that could be problematic in the future? Yeah, I think there's there's a couple of things to keep in mind, I think, with industrial, right now, even though it is really, I call it the hot sector. Um, I think, you know, overall demand is strong um, for warehouse space. However, I think you do run the risk of potential oversupply and maybe weaker absorption in certain markets where maybe available land and zoning is you know, quite favorable to development. I would say markets like uh, Chicago, Atlanta, the DFW Metroplex in Houston right now, where you've got about 85 million square feet under the construction and slated for de delivery in the near term could potentially be a you know, problem in those markets or markets like that. Um, I think also overall, I mean, the sector performance is really being driven by, I think, massive e-commerce demand with tenants like um, Amazon requiring additional warehouse distribution facilities in order to meet like consumer needs and shorten the delivery times, primarily at Amazon with their two-day prime delivery. I think overall the fundamentals for non-warehouse space, so manufacturing, flex space, is significantly weaker. So it's really important to differentiate when you're looking at the portfolios between that type of space and your more traditional you know, bulk fun functional bulk warehouse. I think also to, to dovetail with the e-commerce, I think e-commerce spending took off in 2020 with the pandemic, with people using you know, the internet to order their various goods versus going to a brick and mortar store. I think the projection is as we get into uh, 2021 and the pandemic abates, consumer demand may shift back more towards traditional brick and mortar. So from online back to a service-based based consumption. So something to watch out for is that may be somewhat of a temporary blip in the um, demand side. Got it. Um, I, I guess flipping from uh, asset classes people want to see to stuff that we pretty much never see, you know, when, when do we think the, uh, we'll start to see more hotel product coming through the SASB pipeline? I think that's a, that's a good question. I mean, we really haven't seen a hotel transaction um, in the last year. I think the sole exception being the uh, Goldman's 2020 uh, Town 3 transaction, the refi of the in-town suites portfolio. Um, over the summer, I think it came out closed recently in November. I think in terms of a return of hotels, I think the limited service extended stay sector has held up really well throughout the pandemic. I think that's consistent with what we saw during the Great Recession as well. Um, it's got relatively inelastic demand drivers. You have longer average bookings, and I think substantially less macro correlation 
than the overall hotel sector. I think, you know, the, the sort of more affordable, more economically priced hotels are still enjoying uh, demand. I think they attract more from the, the medical sector, government workers, construction and insurance company contracts. Um, I think to kind of buoy that, uh, both Blackstone and Starwood made a substantial investment in Two Extended Stay America back in last April. So I think I would ex expect to see that product type return first, um, given its resilience and strong operating history. I think next you'll probably see um, resort properties. Um, I think, you know, transient demand, as that increases, the pace of vaccinations continue to increase, you know, into the spring and summer, I think is, you know, restrictions on, you know, pandemic occupancy can need to be, be relaxed. I think most likely in drive to markets um, followed next by fly to destinations as uh, I think air travel also begins to normalize as transient demand increases. Um, I think the key for the, uh, th the resort properties is really going to demonstrate um, the recovery in RevPAR either through, I think, a T9 or a T12, which shows, you know, a sustained growth in NCF back to what we call sort of pre-pandemic 2018, 2019 stabilized levels, as opposed to sort of an annualized T1 or a spot cash flow. Um, I think the last sector to come back will probably be full service product, um, which was catering primarily to business travelers and group and convention business, as that really, I think, experienced a log the largest performance decline over the last year. And I think will most likely take the longest to get back to pre-pandemic levels. Got it. Um, I, I would note as well, you know, for, for those that um, aren't aware, um, Star or Smith Traveler Research, the big hotel research firm, um, they put out a press release every Thursday, I believe, kind of with updated occupancy ADR rev par numbers on a nationwide basis. I think they split it out by hotel class. And, and I think, you know, in the next coming weeks, we'll finally start to see um, what I think are actually meaningful uh, year over year um, weekly performance trends. Um, and, and we'll be able to start seeing whether or not a recovery is taking hold and, and where specifically it's happening. Because for the last several months, um, it's just sort of a steady drumbeat of rep par down 50 percent or 52 or 48. Um, but but now that the COVID numbers are, are going to be um, in that comparison soon, um, those numbers might actually uh, begin to become a, a little bit more meaningful. Um, I, I guess moving on to to the retail sector, what is our view internally at DBRS Morningstar Ben on some of the Class A mall products um, coming through SASB deals? Um, you know, have we have we been approaching those from a cash flow standpoint? You know, how are we comfortable tranching AAA proceeds out of some of these assets uh, these days? I think I think our view on malls overall is I think pretty similar to our view on the hotel sector, in that properties with I think historically strong performance and you know deep pocket institutional sponsorship should recover back to pre-pandemic levels. I think consistent with our sort of sustainable cash flow and value approach. Um, I think you know clearly overall malls have been significantly impacted um, by the economic fall from the pandemic, as well as also by landlord mitigation strategies such as you know rent relief and forbearance. Um, collections in 2020 clearly dropped substantially. And I think a number of malls have seen a number of tenants, both anchor and inline tenants, uh, file for bankruptcy protection or go dark. Um, I think it's likely, at least in the near term, that malls will continue to experience stress uh, until the pandemic fully abates and the economy recovers. Um, I think overall that we have a relatively favorable view on the mall product we've seen to date, which primarily has been you know, well-located malls in affluent areas, uh, strong demographic and demand drivers and limited competition in their markets. Um, leverage on those assets has been, I think, fairly conservative. And we've seen a number of sponsors providing debt service guarantees of varying lengths, uh, one, two years, up to, the, up to the entire term of the loan. Um, majority we've seen have been floating rate, either cash in or cash neutral bridge, lo bridge loans where our sort of our DBRS Morningstar sustainable value is still significantly below the post-COVID appraised value. I think our average value delta was in the high 30s to low 40% range to call it a post-COVID new appraisal. I think at that basis, we feel pretty comfortable with the long-term value. Um, I think, you know, those these short duration, low leverage refinancings are a logical strategy from a sponsor standpoint to buy time and I think allow operations at the properties to stabilize. Uh, in terms of how we're analyzing the cash flow, um, we're definitely paying particular attention to recent collections, 
um, what sort of concessions were provided historically to troubled tenants and sort of the plan and pace of repayment of any deferred rent. Um, we're taking a pretty close look as well at both the overall mall and individual tenant sales performance and occupancy costs relative to its pre-pandemic levels, which I think allows us to assess both the magnitude and pace of the recovery at the property and ultimately conclu conclude to a sustainable NCF that, I, that makes sense relative to call it the runway we have based on the loan term to, to allow the asset to recover. Got it. Yeah, and I guess um, sort of com coming out of any downturn, um, whether it's kind of broad-based or property type specific, the, the first deals are usually the best ones, you know, <laughs> best product, uh, more of a slam dunk on leverage. Um, so, so that all makes sense. I guess wrapping things up on the SASB side, anything kind of new or interesting we're seeing from a structural perspective in these deals? I think in, in terms of structure, we've seen, a, I think, a, a couple of things, one of which is um, like the pro rata allocations and release price. I think there's just been a continuing deterioration um, in that particular aspect. I mean, pro rata paydowns have been around for quite a bit. Um, I think we view them to be relatively credit neutral as long as, you know, in, in our opinion, there are adequate protections in place to prevent adverse selection or cherry picking of the assets being released. I think over the past year, 18 months, we've seen a steady increase in the size of the pro rata bucket, as well as a reduction in individual asset release prices. I think historically, you know, a transaction with a 30% pro rata bucket may have had a tiered release structure with say 105, 110, and 115 for each 10%. I think now we're seeing, you know, 30% buckets with a flat 105% release premium. Um, I think overall that kind of, it's a reduction in what we view to be a credit neutral benchmark. And I think a weakening of the adverse selection protection provided by the release prices. So we have been, I think, over, overall on average increasing the penalty we apply um, for pro rata and weak release, given the uh, continued deterioration of the structure. Um, a few, okay, no, go ahead. Okay, I, I put things in one is um, I think ALA reallocation, something relatively new. Um, it's been a couple of recent deals, portfolio transactions um, for major sponsors. I think we've seen it's, it's relatively novel. Um, it effectively allows for the reappraisal and reallocation of the allocated loan amounts post securitization. So in this case, the borrower at its sole option and without any notice or confirmation from the rating agency can deliver uh, a new set of appraisals to the lender, which will reallocate the outstanding ALAs based on these new as is values of the properties. Um, I think since the initial ALAs are normally static during the life of the transaction, um, we rely on those for determining the uh, release price and it's something we consider when looking at adverse selection penalties. Um, in these cases, we, you know, without notice, we do elect to apply a penalty to the capital structure to account for that level of uncertainty with regards of, you know, if the ALAs are changed, would that effectively change our opinion of the adverse selection potential of the portfolio? Yeah, so without a, without a clear business purpose to this, to this piece of structure that would be credit neutral or credit positive, it seems like there's potential at least to sort of game the system and, and get offside, hence the penalty. Um, so that um, that makes sense. And anything on kind of the LIBOR um, elimination coming up or the LIBOR transition rather? Yeah, I think <laughs> I think it's, it's now been pushed out quite a bit. So, uh, you know, for, for floating rate deals, we do take a look at the language regarding uh, LIBOR elimination and the benchmark transition, which is now scheduled for June, 2023. And I think the, you know, the, the general consensus is um, SOFR will be the replacement index, but we do look for like a specific, call it hardwired language in the legal docs that outlines um, both the transition to the alternative index, as well as an orderly conversion to the index. Um, and per the Fed guidelines, I think we expect that by call it the end of June this year, um, there should be no more loans originated with LIBOR. Got it. And then anything um, kind of to wrap things up here, anything new that we're seeing in terms of collateral and, and property type along those lines? Yeah, I think we've had a number of conversations um, with various participants recently uh, centering around our views on manufactured housing, which is an asset class that we really have not seen in the context of a SASB transaction. 
Uh, I think overall we have a, a positive view on the asset, which is, I mean, historically demonstrated extremely stable and durable cash flows, more so even than I think traditional multifamily. Um, I think the, the current state of the MHC market draws a number of interesting parallels to self, the self-storage market um, prior to the last few years. And it's a, it's a trend to consolidation where you're replacing these somewhat fragmented mom and pop ownership structures um, with institutional sponsors, I think brings a level of, you know, operational efficiency and economies of scale to the portfolios that are definitely beneficial in the long term. Yeah, it seems like the, the secret is out uh, on MH and has been for a little while. Um, you know, I, I would note that the implied cap rates on, on agency manufactured housing um, securitized the past couple of years are actually 10 basis points lower than traditional multifamily once you strip out sort of like the strong kind of dense urban multifamily. And, and I think, uh, you know, the really good quality manufactured housing, you know, cap rates that often have a three handle. So uh, that market has evolved a lot. And, and, and I know it's, it's, it's a sector we, uh, we definitely like. So uh, thanks for the color there. Um, so I think, uh, I think that kind of wraps it up on SASB. Thank you, Greg. Um, moving on to, to the agency CMBS, I guess, specifically for our purposes, the Freddie K deals, uh, which continue to play an outsized role in our market. Um, Ed, can you give us a sense of how things are looking in terms of you know, leverage, market mix, credit enhancement, et cetera? Sure, Kevin. So the general trend that we've observed in recent Freddie transactions is that our levels have been creeping a little bit higher. Now, there are a few reasons for that. First and probably foremost is leverage. So I reviewed a few transactions from early 2020 and compared them to some late 2020 and early 2021 issuance and found that the average LTV in the first group was about 66.9%, and in the second group, 69.6%. So in our model and approach, leverage is one of the most significant factors in our expected losses. Now, while that upward trend in LTVs doesn't appear meaningful on the surface, there's been a marked increase in loans with LTVs above 70%. In fact, in the early 2020 set, the percentage of loans with LTVs greater than 70% was about 41% compared to the most recent issuance where we've seen uh, 52, more than 50%, about 52.7% of the loans now having LTVs greater than 70%. And I don't think it's a secret that valuations of multifamily properties have increased sharply over the past couple of years as rents have increased and cap rates have compressed. Internally, there's been a bit of a feeling that perhaps those values have become somewhat disconnected from the replacement cost in some markets when you consider the cost of land, construction costs, and developer profit. More money continues to flow into the sector, which is pushing property values higher. But the question for us is, are those values necessarily representative of the cash flow that the properties are actually producing? Got it. Yeah, and to your point on valuations being driven in part by cap rate compression, I, I know that we've definitely been seeing a lot more outlier implied cap rates in, in the Freddie deals than in the conduit space. As our cop said, is, is maybe lagging the market, um, you know, with the recent leg down in cap rates. Um, Ed, can, can you speak to how, you know, diversity or, or maybe a lack thereof has been changing over time and, and, and impacting our model's treatment of the Freddie pools? Sure, Kevin. So another significant factor in recent deals relates to loan concentration. The DBRS Morningstar model will assign higher loss multiples in transactions where there's a balance concentrated in fewer loans. And that increase is really coming from the inclusion of large cross collateralized portfolios that we're used to seeing. So while there's been no meaningful change in the average balance over time, those portfolios can result in higher credit enhancement in our model. In a bit, I'll discuss some of the components of those portfolios that might also be contributing to some of the trends that we've seen. Interestingly, one thing that hasn't changed significantly over the past year appears to be the geographic mix. So our DBRS Morningstar average market rank remains relatively steady at about 3.5 in our research. For those who aren't familiar with it, we assign a market rank to every loan in our multi bar pool. Mm. Those market ranks are determined by the zip code of the property and act as a measure of, measure of density and liquidity in a market. A market rank of eight would correspond to an area of high density, employment and economic activity, while a market rank of one is among the most rural areas of the country. Our research has suggested that loans in the most dense market ranks tend to show lower default rates and losses given defaults. 
So we can't say this has contributed significantly to the recent uptick in our levels, but there's been a little bit of movement in the composition of that market rank with fewer loans in the six and seven zones and fewer high market rank loans in the top 15. But with that said, I do think it's a little bit of a surprise that we haven't seen much of a change in those average market ranks across our pools. Property investors are continuing to search for yield, and there's evidence that investors are looking for yield in markets that are more secondary and tertiary than before. So I do think that going forward, we'll be looking for a general trend into less favorable markets. Got it. Um, and you'd mentioned concentration as, as one area where we're seeing um, changes in pool composition. Um, what, what can you kind of point to in particular as driving that? So as I said, we, we've seen a lot more of these cross-collateralized pools, uh, loan portfolios coming into deals. And in some of the more recent transactions, there have been loan portfolios that were in the senior housing sector. So while we might assess the risk of loans that are heavy in independent living units as more akin to traditional multifamily, assisted living presents us with some challenges. Those are more of operating businesses with sometimes very high operating levels. And in addition, the COVID pandemic has added an element of additional risk as seniors housing has been a particular epicenter for virus outbreaks. In some of the recent deals we've seen, in fact, many recent portfolios showed a significant drop in in-place occupancy from pre-COVID period. So what we've done in response is that our concluded cash flows are often coming in significantly below the issuer's cash flows, and we've adjusted the implied cap rates for these assets higher. We also model assisted living centers as hotels, given that they act more as operating businesses and have the high operating leverage that I mentioned previously. So this results in higher leverage in the, in the model. And then given the concentrated nature of the portfolios, we've seen an increase in our levels on rated transactions where this type of collateral has been included. For example, we're seeing expected losses on assisted living loans of greater than 7%, which compared to the average expected loss of 3% on a Freddie pool, can really add considerably to our final levels. Yeah, and I and think, um, go ahead. oh, sorry, sorry. And I was just gonna say, I think that, you know, in, in the seniors product and especially assisted living, I, I think that over time we've, we've also struggled um, kind of bridging that gap between concluded property value um, and replacement cost where, you know, the cost to, to build the structures plus the land, plus a very hefty developer profit uh, usually leaves you still way, way short of, of concluded value with uh, the plug in between those seemingly a, a business value component. So I think that's something that for, for years now we've, we've struggled to, to come to grips with. And, and as you say, you know, those elevated expected losses reflect what we view as, you know, maybe some business risk component and, and not really pure, pure real estate lending. Um, any, anything else structure-wise uh, within the Freddie deals that um, we're seeing in, in loans recently? Yeah, one issue that I wanted to address is that we've started to see increased lending on leasehold properties. Our team discussed leaseholds in a recent webinar, but I think it's worth attention here given these inclusion of these loans in recent Freddie deals. Ground lease bifurcations aren't new by any stretch, but the activity in the sector is starting to increase. So essentially at acquisition, a buyer will separate the fee and the leasehold estates on the properties and obtaining financing on both components. The financing of the leased fee estate is accomplished by way of a pretty significant ground rent payment that can come to more than 25% of the property cash flow with annual rent increases. So one of the concerns we have is that this large fixed ground rent will siphon cash flow away from the property and increase operating leverage. So you wind up with a property that's much got much more potential volatility and cash flow than before. And as we've reviewed some of these loans, I don't think that we've seen appraiser implied cap rates that really reflect the risk. After all, you've just removed from the value one of its most stable components, the land, and replaced it with a leakage of cash flow over time. So as we become concerned that via these separate financings of the two estates, it's created a bit of a financial engineering arbitrage that may believe that may leave behind a leasehold that's that's somewhat over leveraged. So what we've tried to capture that additional risk, Kevin, is through cap rate adjustments in our model. What we essentially do is set a baseline market cap rate for the leased fee that's about two to 250 basis points lower than the combined fee simple estate. We value that component and whatever value remains in our approach is the leasehold value. 
We then compute an implied cap rate based on the leasehold cash flow and that residual leasehold value. And then we compare that, that calculated internal cap rate to that of the appraiser and determine whether we need to make additional adjustments. Uh, the way we look at it, a, a ground rent that's more than 25% of the leasehold net cash flow should result in a leasehold cap rate that's about 100 basis points above the fee simple. And where the ground rent approach is 40%, we can expect to see that implied cap rate about 200 basis points higher. And of course, that higher cap rate in our model will translate to higher LTV and higher expected losses. Yeah, and I would, uh, I would presume as well, if, if we're moving uh, cap rates 100 to 200 basis points off of a very low, you know, five, percent or four and a half percent base level that's that's clearly a uh, a very large haircut um to value um anything else uh you you have for us on the agency side yeah just just one closing thing on on uh, the, the ground leases the next thing we're watching for is the length of the ground leases and the potential for any fair market value rent resets in the future these rent resets can result in significantly increased rent payments that may not necessarily correspond to the growth in cash flow over that time. So that's something we're watching for. And, uh, and hopefully it's not something that's gonna become more common, but uh, it's, it, we've got our eyes open. Got it. And I know something that um, we're also seeing and trying to, uh, to, to figure out is a complicating factor where there's a, a purchase option of the fee interest out in the future um, and, and how that might you know, sort of ameliorate uh, any of these issues, but uh, these these leasehold deals are are complicated and and definitely deserve uh, our scrutiny and, and investors as well. Um, thank you, Ed. Uh, I, I want to turn to the conduit space now. Um, historically, really has been the bread and butter for all of us in the CMBS sector, um, but has really taken on a diminished role in recent years. Volume, I think, remains really extremely just depressed. I think to date, only three three deals had priced all year through the end of last week totaling just a little over $3 billion. Uh, That's down more than 50% compared to the same time last year, and, and none of that was impacted by COVID. Um, Brandon, what are we see, seeing in recent conduit deals in terms of property type composition maybe and, and how that's been changing a little bit over time? Yeah, so we've, we've definitely seen, as it's no surprise, very little retail, or at least a diminished uh, retail uh, percentage. I think that's down maybe about... 10% from call it the 2020 uh, post COVID type of uh, conduit deals versus 2018, 2019 vintage deals. Um, in addition, there's virtually no hotel properties. Um, and I, I don't think that comes as any surprise. Um, you know, looking back at some of the stats, uh, really, again, the post COVID 2020 vintage um, conduit deals, I think there's about 2% hotel. And most of that is coming from the MGM and I think like the JW Marriott in Nashville. Um, there's just, you know, very few other limited service type of hotels that have been included in those deals. Um, so what's taking the place of that is mostly office. Um, you know, office stats are up maybe, I think they were 28% uh, call it pre-COVID deals. And now they're roughly about 40% of any given conduit deal. So. Uh, quite a bit of office space uh, in those deals and, and marginal, maybe marginal increase in some multifamily. Yeah, and with, with respect to office, I know we see, you know, some deals over 50% or even pushing 60%. Um, you know, it, in terms of, you know, how how we're looking at these deals, um, you know, what what are we seeing in terms of the office product? Is it suburban, urban, kind of the different MSA mixes, what does that look like and, and, and how does that translate into kind of our view on these pools? I think there's still a mix. Um, I mean, you're still seeing a lot of the suburban type of uh, product out there, but you know, based on uh, some of the stats that I pulled, um, it seems like it's predominantly more the urban markets. Uh, so you know, the markets, market ranks, as we've kind of alluded to earlier, uh, six, seven, and eight, which are traditionally more the urban uh, type of markets, uh, you know, those products are up, call it from 33% to about 50% now. And the MSA groups, which, you know, it's the top 25 MSAs, we kind of categorize those into three different buckets. 
Um, and uh, MSA3, which is you know traditionally your strongest markets, call it New York, San Francisco, LA, DC, uh, you know, that uh, percentage has increased from roughly 46% to 60%. Uh, so it kind of tells me that uh, you're seeing a lot more of these core urban uh, assets. And I think it kind of relates back to you know, what Greg was talking about earlier with regard to the SASB stuff. We're seeing a lot of those SASB quality type of loans. Um, they've executed a SASB, but they've put pieces of those deals into the conduits. Um, and, and kind of going back and, and looking at that, um, 2018, 2019 vintage, um, Perry Pasoon loan count was about 35% of transactions. And these post-COVID uh, transactions is about 55%. So uh, definitely seeing a lot a lot more of those pieces. And I think we've seen that as we've, you know, gone through and done our analysis on these deals. It's, oh, there's this New York office property in, in the pool again. Um, so we've definitely seen a larger percentage of that. So I think, you know, that's helping uh, with our overall levels um, and the overall expected loss of these deals. Because uh, certainly, you know, our model it looks a lot more favorably upon the, uh, you know, core urban markets. Um, in addition to that, I think the LTVs have come down a little bit, uh, about 5%. So, you know, as we kind of stated previously, uh, LTV is one of our main drivers in, uh, in the model. So lower LTV, higher market ranks, um, you know, those are both, both having uh, beneficial, um, uh, impacts on the, on the overall levels. So you touched on the the MSA grouping that uh, the CMBS Insight model does within the context of all multi-borrower deals for us, with MSA Group 3 being um, those kind of historical, mostly coastal markets that have performed uh, very well, sort of the, the lowest default probability of the largest 25 MSAs, the MSA Group 2 or sort of the middle ground. What is, what's in the MSA Group 1 category? Because we're going to touch on th this concept of sort of model outliers and drivers of outsized expected loss. And, and this is part of it. Like, what, 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 what are the typical MSA Group 1s and what, what types of characteristics do they share maybe? So I think some of the more typical ones, um, Chicago, Atlanta, uh, Phoenix, Houston, Detroit, um, you know, I think just generally speaking, those have been lower performing uh, markets, higher volatility historically. Um, and, you know, being in Chicago, I think we're, you know, we're no uh, stranger to the Chicago market. I mean, the downtown office market has has really struggled in the last 10 years. And, and we've seen high vacancies. We've seen really high TI leasing costs to try to attract uh, those tenants. Um, so, and I think you've seen uh, with regard to like Houston, I mean, historically it's been a very volatile market because it's so reliant on oil and gas. And we're seeing that now too. Um, you know, yeah, that's, plus that's a good point. There's a lot of talk in, about a, a market like Houston diversifying, you know, much more so than they were in the 1980s. Yet, if you look at, you know, a, a lot of the, you know, specialty service loans in the conduit space, it's just sort of littered with office and hotel deals in Houston. So clearly they're, uh, they're really levered to the, the oil and gas industry uh, still. And I think you, you highlighted, you know, sort of a Detroit and Chicago on the one hand, which would be sort of low growth or no growth markets, um, right. but sort of established in a lot of infill areas. Um, the flip side are those high growth markets, Atlanta and Dallas and Houston, which I think many people would, would think would perform very well. But uh, it seems like historically, at least, the source of growth has been uh, the avail availability of land, um, the minimal barriers to entry, the, you know, Houston, no zoning requirements. So um, it seems like uh, a high growth in a market is sometimes, you know, not actually, you know, helpful for, for propping up real estate values. And, and I know that one thing we're highly focused on, obviously, is, you know, as, you know, people continue to relocate from sort of you know, historically more established markets in the Northeast and the Midwest to the Sun Belt and Texas, um, is that going to change the game really for real estate? And, um, you know, sometimes I think we feel like that's a somewhat compelling narrative, but I know certainly that, you know, Atlanta and Dallas, you know, those MSAs were growing at 30% per decade in the 80s and 90s. 
Um, and that really didn't help out um, probability of default, um, historically speaking, or I guess default rates, historically speaking. Um, so in the future, um, maybe they flip the switch and, and it becomes very hard to build um, in, in those markets. But for now, I don't, I don't think we're seeing that necessarily. Um, I guess specifically on Office, Brandon, you know, what, what is our view here? Um, is everyone kind of going to work from home forever? Uh, what, are we, what are we looking at? Well, I, I think it depends on who you ask. I, I definitely think, uh, you know, if you ask me, I'm perfectly comfortable comfortable working from home for, uh, you know, more than I thought I would be. Uh, but I think just generally speaking, um, you know, when we talk to people in our office, when we talk to other people that we, you know, our colleagues, um, I think everybody's kind of transitioned over and, you know, successfully so. Um, you know, limitations aside, I, I would assume that you're going to have some kind of flexible work working arrangements in the foreseeable future. Um, you know, is that going to be two, three days a week? I think that's kind of the, the normal range. I'm sure other people are going to be um, more akin to the four or five days. Um, you know, I was reading some articles this morning, um, and, you know, suggesting that, you know, it, it's definitely, uh, even with law firms, you know, that's, that's something uh, with some of the younger staffers that it may be a, a trend there. So, um, you know, I think it's here to stay. Uh, what's that ultimate impact going to be? I think we're all kind of, uh, I would say guessing, but it, it largely has not been figured out yet. Um, I think that's something that's going to happen over the next two to three years, you know, as companies uh, figure out really what their space needs are. Um, you know, there's certainly that argument out there that companies will still need the same amount of space, but they'll just, you know, have more space per employee. Um, and on the flip side of that, they'll just take less space and have fewer people working in the office. So, um, you know, it's going to be a mix. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that at least at the start of the pandemic to kind of address that, uh, we were really looking at vacancy rates um, and, and looking at the, you know, historical five-year um, numbers, but also kind of looking at those five-year projections, um, looking in to see where the new supply is coming online. Um, you know, specifically, not even for office space, but just, um, you know, all sectors, because um, I think that's going to be a good predictor. Um, and I think going forward, you know, as some of these, uh, you know, uh, more definitive plans become, uh, you know, part of the metrics, I think looking at the availability rates is going to be uh, another key component that we're going to have to pay attention to, because uh, maybe vacancy isn't that strong, but uh, you know, you've got another 10, 20% availability in a submarket. Um, you know, that's definitely going to show that it's a weaker, a weaker area, and that's going to take some time. Uh, you know, I think we saw that uh, during the last downturn. Um, there were specific markets that had uh, very high uh, vacancy rates and with submarkets that had climbed, and it took four or five years for them to really uh, start to rebound because it's a lot of space to, you know, take down. Yeah, and I think one, you know, I think we're going to address, um, I think we've gotten a question going into specific detail on, on some haircut drivers and, and what we're seeing on, on cash flow underwriting, and, and maybe we'll get into that further if we have time. Um, but you know, vacancy in office properties is tough, I feel like, because, you know, we're often seeing, you know, issuer underwritings with 10% or less vacancy, and there are just very few um, sub markets or micro markets where long term vacancy is is less than ten percent. Um, you know, I, I pulled um, some some data from from 2012 and 2013. So you know, loans that have seasoned for a good bit of time, um, and you know, from office from office properties from from that time period, uh, occupancy on average has come down by 4.4 percent. Um, as of uh, year end 2019. So it, even when you're taking a vintages of, of loans where you know, they were securitized when the, the office market was kind of back on an upswing and then you're cutting it off before COVID even hits or you hit any recession, you're still seeing you know, an overall pretty serious decline in vacancy rates. So I think our, our, our take on vacancy on office properties has been consistent. It's fairly conservative. Uh, and, and we're sort of protected already. And I think the other big part of it has to be leverage, right? You know, if you're, if you're doing 55% LTV loans, you, know, you don't have to predict all this stuff per perfectly. You mentioned a lot of the uncertainty out there and, and none of us here know what's really gonna happen. Um, but, 
you know, if I think if the leverage is, is appropriate and then the underwriting is, is, has a little bit of a conservative bias that obviously, you know, buys you a lot of, uh, room for, uh, for error, I think. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on really briefly um, was the um, the growth of some uh, concentration of Amazon industrial warehouse type of facilities and, and conduit tapes um, that have been coming in. You know, I think as a headline, uh, people would usually think that that's a good thing. You have a, a big name, a high investment grade tenant um, taking space in a, in a hot sector. I think the challenge has been that um, you know, we're not seeing a lot of, you know, just bulk warehouse industrial where the tenant's paying four or five, six dollars per square foot. And you have kind of typical, you know, hundred dollar per square foot plus minus valuations. Instead, you know, we are seeing some of these assets where the rent that Amazon's paying seems to be two times market or, or more. And we're seeing valuations of two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars plus per square foot. Um, and it's just unclear to us really where the where the valuation is coming from um, and if there's a replacement tenant behind Amazon if they leave. Um, so, you know, a, a new issue that's really only been cropping up over the past few months, but something something we're paying attention to. And again, we think deserves the scrutiny of investors, um, you know, even though the, the loans are not typically very large. I don't think we've seen any crap crack the top 10 or maybe even the top 15. Um, some some funky stuff going on there um, a little bit. Uh, I wanted to touch briefly on on this concept of, of model outliers. You know, as Brandon had mentioned, you know, some of the market stats in terms of, you know, where these pro properties and conduit deals are located uh, have been favorable. But, you know, those weighted averages sometimes you know, are not telling the full story. And I think what we're finding is that, you know, the, the CMBS Insight model um, really differentiates sharply between loans it likes and loans that it doesn't like. And a few major outlier loans can really push levels around uh, pretty dramatically. Um, so really, you know, we could, we could have a range of outcomes in our model output uh, that's much wider than the range of execution levels. Um, so we, we really do feel kind of to emphasize that there are fairly large discrepancies in credit across deals, um, whether or not that's manifesting itself in, in the final levels, kind of generally speaking. Um, when we talk about outlier loans, Ed had touched on, you know, what typical expected losses are for Freddie deals, you know, conduit deals, the typical expected losses are between say two and three and a half percent. We think of outliers as an expected loss of, seven percent or somewhere in the double digits um and you know for context i guess if you had a loan that was five percent of your pool uh, and the expected loss was a 10 versus a three for the overall pool um that that widens out your pool level expected loss by 35 bips it doesn't seem like a lot but that can that can have a an impact of, of almost a full point of of credit enhancement uh add on at triple below which is very meaningful um, so if you get a few of these in the top top 15 loans, you really can get um, levels in the middle of the capital structure that push out north of 9% or even 10% when you exclude the impact of the pieces of shadow rated loans that get in there. Um, I guess the question for us a lot of times internally is, you know, do we think that these outcomes make sense that there's such a wide uh, variety uh, of final final outcomes here? And, and we, we really think it, it does make sense. Um, especially as it pertains to the middle of the capital structure, where that triple B low, triple B minus level is 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 a fulcrum bond on which deal performance really rests. Um, and to get paid back, you you need to to really nail the the worst loans in the pool and get those right. Um, so some of the attributes of of expect a loss outliers to to hit these quickly. Um, a lot of times these are office properties. A lot of times they're in suburban markets. A lot of times they have very high haircuts somewhere in the 25 to 35 percent area, even though, you know, average haircuts for pools could be 10, 11, 12, 13 um, percent. And then sometimes as well, uh, these loans would have been subject to a value adjustment if we uh, felt that the appraised value um, was not really supportable um, and we felt like it it merited um, moving a little bit. Um, so. The, the concept of these expect a loss outliers is, is something, you know, that we spend a lot of time on and try to understand what the model really likes and what it really doesn't like. But the, the end result is um, that, you know, pools that are clean, 
um, you know, really end up looking a lot better um, than than pools with just a couple blemishes if those blemishes uh, could be very damaging um, to that low investment grade levels. Uh, so just wanted to highlight a couple of the of the nuances uh, there in, in, in how our model is working. So we only have about 10 minutes left. Um, the, the series CLO market was the last we were going to touch on. Um, can kind of do that briefly here and see if we have time for, for a question or two. Um, you know, the the first of uh, two Aries deals priced in, in late January, and it's really been kind of off to the races ever since then. Um, issuers seem to be running to the market, uh, rushing to the market to, to get out, you know, while it's open and accommodating uh, since spreads have fallen so far uh, since last fall. And, and we've already seen eight, eight CRE CLOs priced this year totaling six and a half billion dollars, and, and there's still a few more in the pipeline. I think coming in the next you know weeks or month. Um, so a, a very very active sector um, to date, um, and and we've um, you know we've also been seeing kind of on the surveillance side, um, you know four to five loans coming through for rating agency confirmation. So we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of activity on the managed deals. Of new origination so so kind of a lot of stuff going on on both sides um i would say that you know our our feeling is that the continue inve- continued investor demand and, and tight pricing uh does make a lot of sense in many respects given the relatively strong performance of the cre clos um to date obviously we're not anywhere through um this cycle um but the performance has held up uh, fairly well and we think that does make sense given that you're looking at you know, acquisition loans outnumbering refis on a three to one basis. That's almost the mirror image of a conduit deal where you have 25 to 35% acquisition and 65 to 75 refi. Um, bolstered by the fact that in these CRE CLOs, you often have, you know, a purchase price sort of supporting an as is value uh, that shows some equity, um, you know, behind the loan. And that purchase price is of a distressed asset itself. So unlike the conduit space where, you know, the, the loans are sized to perfection and, and, and people are really only pulling the trigger on a 10-year fixed rate loan when everything's perfect, um, you know, these, these loans, although they do have a lot of execution risk sometimes, um, maybe have less downside than, than some people are expecting. Um, you know, in terms of business plans that, that have been challenging for us because um, we see all kinds um, you know, we, we are seeing a, a lot more multifamily loans where the business plan is very, very modest. We're talking capital improvements of less than, you know, 5,000 per unit, sometimes even a few thousand per unit. That really doesn't buy you much. It's hard to move the needle on rents. Um, so we're trying, we're trying to, to spot uh, assets where there, there's cash flow and value growth being underwritten, but there's really not a, a way to get there. Um, we're also focused on office buildings, just like in the conduit sector. Um, the, the issues are the same in terms of vacancy and leasing costs, um, but it, they can really be magnified in the CRE CLOs where, you know, some of the product is more in the secondary markets with lower gross rents. All of these little nicks we're taking out of the cash flow, um, you know, really, really take a big bite out of it because there's not a lot of uh, NOI to work with um, when you're signing, you know, $25, $30 uh, gross rent deals. Um, and then finally, I think we are seeing uh, our fair share of sort of um, loans with without a lot of business plan at all. You know, you're kind of playing the game of bridge loan or high leverage floater where, you know, we have to decipher whether there's really a plan at all to uh, to increase value or it's it's basically, you know, just a high leverage short term loan with uh, with nothing else going on. And, and those can fit into pools as long as we make sure that you know, the expected loss that they're carrying makes sense, but uh, but otherwise those are problematic. Um, you know, in, in terms of leverage versus advance rate, you know, advance rate being the usually the single most important thing to the to the issuers. Um, you know, it's it has been following a fairly logical narrative where you know the lowest leverage all multifamily pool uh, was carrying the highest advance rate. Uh, that was the MF1 2021 FL5 deal. And then on the flip side, the highest leverage uh, mixed collateral pool, Loan Core CRE4, had had the lowest advance rate. Um, so while the sector is fairly complicated, you know, it does often follow a, a fairly logical narrative. And again, as it as it relates to kind of differentiation across deals and how our model looks at things, you know, you can see kind of a sharp 
um, a sharp distinction, you know, on, on the low end with a, of the four deals we've rated so far this year, AAA credit enhancement of 30% versus a high end of 47. Um, and on the low end of, of triple below at, at 14 and three quarters versus a high end all the way up north of 22%. So there, there's a wide variety of executions we're seeing in the market. And this isn't surprising because it's not the conduit sector where everybody is sort of competing for the same loans, doing the same thing, you know, pricing to the same rating agency execution. The CRE CLO issuers have their kind of own individual characteristics. They're, they're, you know, have certain preferences on, you know, collateral type and, and all sorts of different things. So we expect to continue to see that, that kind of differentiation. Um, th there's some other stuff, you know, to, to cover on the CRE CLO side, but um, there are a couple questions um, coming in. Uh, let me look here. So, so somebody did ask if, if we're seeing um, CRE CLO uh, taking any share away from the conduit market. I don't feel like that's really happening to any great extent. Um, th there don't seem to be a whole lot of loans coming through the CRE CLO business that would really be securitizable in a, in a conduit context. You know, loans carrying a seven to eight debt yield, you know, with a fairly high occupancy rate. There could be some on the margins, but I, I don't think we're seeing um, a whole lot of that um, necessarily. Um, and, and again, we did have a question on sort of details, um, examples of the most common causes for, for large haircuts. Uh, we talked about office a little bit, um, but it, we talked about the vacancy side. I think the bigger story in, in the office sector and, and our issuer clients are probably sick of hearing us talk about it, but leasing costs are a major pain point. Um, we continue to underwrite um, leasing costs based on what it actually takes to lease space at a property. Um, and unfortunately that just seems to be at sharp odds with, um, with most of the uh, issuer underwriting assumptions that we see, which in many instances are still you know, a dollar per square foot combined TILC or, or something like that. Um, so we're generating a lot of cash flow variance um, off of off of the leasing costs, um, and we continue to think that you know we're we're looking at it in a in a smart way, and, and we try to get as much detail and, and information as we can. Uh, but that often does uh, does cause a, a pretty pretty large variance. Um, I'm going to see if there's, we've got about one minute left. I was going to see if there's any other uh, questions in the queue here. Um, for, for the other panelists, is there anything I missed or uh, did I overlook a question that, that somebody had an answer on? Yeah, Kevin, somebody call, but, yeah. had a question that said, uh, if you're seeing, as you state, better markets, higher SASB paired to super portions, and lower leverage in recent conduit deals. What factors explain the wider levels from DBRS Morningstar? Uh, levels have widened as opposed to tightened, which seems at odds to, to those trends. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's a combination. Well, I think it's a combination of a couple of things. Um, you know, diversity can can sometimes be causing some issues, especially at the top of the capital structure as it pertains to credit enhancement level drift, but. I think a lot of it is the differentiation across deals. Those weighted average stats kind of are what they are, but uh, that could mean that there are some very low leverage deals with a huge amount of like high quality um, market concentration uh, that our levels look very low uh, in comparison to a deal with a lot more of those kind of suburban outlier loans um, where our levels are quite elevated. And again, on average, you know, maybe it looks, you know, like something, but the individual components, you know, of, of, the, of the market and, and all those different data points are, I think, uh, showing a lot of disparity. And, and Kevin, I would add to that. You know, I think our, as you touched on, you know, TIs and, and vacancy are always uh, huge outliers for us. And I, I would say the TIs maybe are even uh, becoming more of an outlier as we're seeing uh, kind of higher TI costs in, in this post-pandemic market. Um, in, in addition to that, I think just looking at our haircut percentages, I think they have edged up over the last few years, you know, kind of looking at some of the deals that we've been engaged on conduit-wise, they're in that uh, upper single digit, you know, call it to 12% at the high range versus deals that we're not getting engaged on, um, you know, they're 
couple points higher on, on the haircut percentages. So I, I definitely think there's some differentiation there. You know, even though some of these metrics might look better, I think on, on some of those other loans where let's call it our, our uh, you know, our levels are a little bit wider. Um, you know, I think it's reflective of all those individual stats and including uh, haircuts. That's a good point. And then Kevin. Right, well, thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, one more question came in. Uh, what are your expectations on static versus managed CLOs going forward? Maybe you can hit that in 10 seconds. Yeah, <laughs> I think, um, you, you know, it, it seems like the managed deals have really kind of come back uh, with a vengeance. They're, they're almost 50% of the issuance this year. So I think we'll, we'll continue to see more of it if, you know, the price you have to pay for that option is not obscene. Um, there, there are definitely some issuers that, that value it. So I, I think we, we'd expect to see a healthy dose of it going forward. All right. Well, thank you, uh, panelists, for, for joining, and thanks for uh, everybody that dialed in. Uh, have a great week, and if anyone has any questions on anything we covered or anything else, feel free to, to reach out to Ed, uh, Brandon, Greg, or myself. Thank you.